one of the functions of language, one of the many functions of language, is to describe our experiences in such a way as that we can attempt to share them with other people. There are problems there. Um, if you start taking those descriptions as facts, that's the uh, axiom error that I think is being committed here. Uh, something that is axiomatic is then taken as a fact and uh, then once that is established you make a bunch of deductions from that or inductions depending on how the argument is put and you reach a conclusion. Um, now the objection to attacking the axioms, I guess, is the way that it would be looked at, is if you do that, then we can't do anything. We can't discuss anything. Well, my counter to that is my riposte or rebuttal or whatever you want to call it is, what difference does it make if we can't discuss it? <laughs> that doesn't change anything. Reality doesn't owe us ease of explanation. Um, just because our tools are not up to the job doesn't mean that we then have to say reality isn't that way because our tools can't handle that. <laughs> um, it's funny that people always call me a solipsist, but that to me is solipsism. It's like, la, 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 reality is the way I want it to be. That to me is what's taking place here when you just sort of insist that we have to have these axioms that are facts. Um, I've raised this before, but it reminds me of that conversation between the Pope and Galileo, where uh, the Pope says, um, okay, we finally, after bugging you for weeks to get you to recant your view that the Earth revolves around the Sun and not vice versa, now you're going to sign on this piece of paper and say the Sun revolves around the Earth. Um, now, I can imagine the discussions that took place. The Pope, let's just give the Pope hand, the benefit of the doubt here, something that uh, I'm not very used, used to doing. But let's say that we give the Pope the benefit of the doubt here, and the Pope is trying to say, okay, let's say the Pope believes in all this Catholicism stuff. Let's say he actually does believe. This is an interesting thought, eh? The people at the very top of the Catholic Church actually believe it. That's actually a rather revolutionary idea, if you ask me, because I don't think anyone ever really thought that the Pope's ever believed any of that stuff. But anyway... Um, Let's say that the Pope did believe it. He would say, look, Galileo, I understand what you're saying. I understand that, you know, your observations seem to be pretty solid here, that the Earth revolves around the Sun, not the other way around. It turns out that, you know, blind man in the elephant style, both the Pope and Galileo were, in a sense, wrong. <laughs> but that's neither here than near here nor there. Um, he would have said, look, the idea that the Earth moves around. Uh, the idea that the, the, the idea that the Sun moves around the Earth is the cornerstone of our accepted belief, our accepted reality, um, our Aristotelian worldview. Uh, we have to assume that. If we don't assume it, then the whole thing starts to fall apart. And what we get is, right now, we've got social peace here. We've got an agreed upon reality. We have an absolute truth, Christianity which everybody, or almost everybody, can access. It makes our society cohere. If you take that away, then what you get is insanity. You get complete disorientation on a cosmic scale. Nobody even knows what direction is up or down. So we have to have this. It's not that we are honestly trying to kill you for having said this, Mr. Galileo. Um, we just... You know, it, it, it's a matter of, if we don't accept this, what's going to happen? What will be the consequences of this? Um, guilt. <laughs> um, you, Mr. Galileo, by abolishing the reality, by abolishing the bulwark that we've built against Satan, you're essentially going to allow Satan to run rampant throughout the world. Um, and to be perfectly honest, there is some truth to that in that the social makeup of, you know, Renaissance Europe was such that if you did actually take religion out of it, the, the whole social order would collapse. You, you, it, religion underpinned 
everything. And if you did take that out, the social order would collapse, and you could actually point to Renaissance Germany for what happens when you um, take apart absolute truth. It was utter chaos. Um, one of the worst wars in human history was the Thirty Years' War, which was essentially just a war between Catholicism and Protestantism, and between various permutations of Catholicism and Protestantism against each other. It was everybody fighting and committing the most horrific atrocities in the name of their access to absolute truth. So, you know, you, in a sense, the Pope was simply saying, we have to assume this. We have to, or else horrific suffering will, in, will ensue. This is precisely the argument that gets made when they say, if we have to assume that suffering has value, and if we don't assume that, then suffering takes over the universe. Just substitute um, the Pope's Satan for the more modern term, suffering. Um, as I say, there's a direct line that leads from planting a flag in the ground and saying, this is the building block of reality, and way down the line to the guy in that infamous metaphor, strapped to a gurney, having a spike driven into his eye. <laughs> um, you can see the progression. We have to assume certain things, or else certain things will happen, and Satan's reign will take place on Earth. In some views, Satan is already reigning, and the only thing that is holding us, holding us back from actually having to experience all of this is this self-constructed reality. Everyone is suffering. It's universal. Everybody suffers. We all wither and die. We all get diseases. We all, our teeth fall out. We get, you know, all kinds of bad things. People don't have enough to eat. Can you imagine what Renaissance Europe was like? So you can say, look, Christianity tells everybody that your suffering has meaning. That your suffering is, in a sense, redemptive. Uh, and the ideal that we dangle in front of everybody of heaven is not that different from the simple ideal of non-existence. So you have to be careful of that kind of thing because again it becomes dogmatic. The only thing in um, the Pope's universe that was worth doing anything about was fighting Satan, uh, even if it meant quashing discovered truths that conflicted with the tools that they had established in order to fight Satan. Catholicism and our new version of Catholicism is the scientific reality that we've all agreed upon. Now, I'm questioning that reality, at least its absoluteness, or at least our perception of it as absolute. Um, and, of course, the result is denunciation, guilt. It's not that your arguments don't make sense, but you personally are a bastard for bringing this about. I don't give a damn about your stupid highfalutin ideas. Look what you're doing with them. Look what's going to result. E per si mueve, and yet it moves. Um, Inventive Harvest, in the video that I've responded to, said at about 11.30, 11 minutes 30 seconds, this isn't that we're doing anything to anybody. We're not deliberately screwing up the universe to allow Cthulhu to wake up and run rampant all over the world. <laughs> to the best and the most honest of our cognitions or of our thinking and our reasoning, this seems to be the way it is. Seems to be. Add guilt in there. No, 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 no. You don't see it that way at all. You're just a bad person. You're just disruptive. You're just trying to cause trouble scapegoating. The Enmendum philosophy hinges upon guilt. Reality must be bent into shape or else horrible things will happen and it'll be the fault of the people who refuse to do that. I've always said the meltdowns, the anger, the personal attack, the denunciations and in Mendham has ethics by denunciation down to a science. Um, all of that 
is not some eccentricity. It's not some um, foible or character uh, sort of, I don't know, character quirk. The anger in the denunciation is part of the argument. It's part of the cosmology. It's part of the point of view. The guilt that underpins all of this, that says you can't go and think like that. You can't do that. Because on the other side of that wall, to quote, you know, from my favorite movie, Baron Munchausen, are the hordes of the Sultan's army. The Turks are on the other side of that wall. If they get in here, they'll destroy everything. We cannot allow this. Um, I don't know. Um, Roger Friddle directed me to the Stephen King novella, N, where a guy has... He develops obsessive compulsive disorder, but his obsessive compulsive disorder is an actual means of keeping an insane universe from smashing into our universe. The same thing. Um, there's no goodness in the universe. We're just saving ourselves from Satan taking over the universe. And anyone who actually isn't part of the solution is part of the problem. <laughs> Guilt. Don't let your thoughts go beyond a certain point. Because when you do, you unlock Cthulhu. You, you allow Satan into this universe. Or your, um, your relativism, your mental masturbation, your, your stupid word games, if they get out and they influence enough people, will allow suffering to continue forever and it'll be your fault! <laughs> you have to sort of see that argument as a whole. And then the rage and the personal attacks and the vituperation and everything actually make sense. Um, it's part of the argument. It's part of the case. You can't just say, if these people would stop being so horrible and so nasty and misanthropic and everything... Um, maybe I could deal with them. How can they do that, given what their worldview is, what their cosmology is? If I had their cosmology, I would be exactly the same way. Um, but I don't have that cosmology. And it's not a question of me wanting to, although, again, th this will be the way that it's phrased. It's saying that I'm just doing this on purpose, or I'm playing games, or whatever. I'm, I think that it's funny that everybody is suffering, or... You know, I'm, I have some sort of, you know, schadenfreude. You know, I'm getting kicks out of stamping on people's faces or something like that. A denunciation, guilt, scapegoating. Um, that's what ensues. Again, you get from an axiom that A is A, and you get automatically, or not automatically, but inexorably, you get to the spike in the eye, or the slave owner raping his slaves simply by um, accepting a certain axiom as inviolable. It is haram to challenge that point of view because of the horrible things that will ensue. I get that. I suppose that's why it kind of evokes fear in people when you start kicking every single prop away. But I repeat, and yet it moves. And it doesn't matter if um, reality doesn't fit. Um, reality is still what it is. Or it's not so simplistically encapsulated, I guess. Because I'm not even saying reality is a particular thing. What I'm saying is reality isn't so easily pinned down.